Excellent. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Erin Reed. I'm the marketing lead with Polaris MEP. And uh, we are in luck today because Chris Neary is our presenter for this introduction to total productive maintenance. Now, Chris has helped companies achieve results with total productive maintenance, both as an operations leader for Khaleesi Bakery and also as a project manager here at Polaris MEP. So for those of you who have not had a chance to work with Polaris MEP, here's a little bit of information about us. Polaris MEP is a nonprofit consultancy. Our entire mission is helping Rhode Island manufacturers stay competitive, improve and achieve their goals. We are part of the NIST National Network of Manufacturing Extension Partnerships. That's the MEP in Polaris MEP. And like you, we're very much focused on how to reduce waste. So Polaris MEP connects Rhode Island manufacturers with a variety of solutions that do reduce waste, that do increase productivity, and do increase quality. Our center director, Kathy Mahoney, likes to say we can help you with the top line, the bottom line, and the pipeline. And so that's why we're excited today to kind of hear some thoughts around on those areas. So as I mentioned, the NIST MEP National Network is a national program with an MEP center in every state and also in Puerto Rico. And each one of us is tasked with helping manufacturers achieve their vision. We are able to tap into this network to both implement best practices and pull in new resources. So it allows us to be very locally rooted in Rhode Island, but have a national reach to help you. So with all of that, let's go ahead and turn it over to Chris. Are you ready to discuss the benefits of total productive maintenance? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Aaron, for introducing us this morning. And thank everybody for joining us this morning on the webinar. Like we stated, this is going to be recorded. Uh, so you'll have an opportunity to view it again. And there will be a survey at the end that goes out for this. And you will also have an opportunity to get a copy of the slides. So we'll talk a little bit about that, but I wanna welcome everybody. And what I would just like to do is if you could throw in the chat, what are you hoping to learn today about total productive maintenance? When I took a look at, at the list for this morning, it looks like we have a pretty good mix of maintenance engineering folks and operations folks. And one of the things that we see at Rhode Island Manufacturers is there seems to be a line at a certain point, companies may have a, maintenance, a dedicated maintenance department. And then at another line, companies have an engineering department and a maintenance department. So you might have folks who focus on the capital equipment, folks who focus on facilities maintenance. Uh, and then you've got a lot of small manufacturers who are making do with what they have. So I wouldn't call it a dedicated maintenance staff, but it's a mix of outsourcing and what can we do in-house. So a real, real large gamut, but just curious to see, you know, what folks might be hoping to learn about today. We've heard from Michael, who's looking for a refresher. Please go ahead and use that chat and let us know what the rest of you are hoping to learn today. Great, wonderful. So I will say we've got a lot of great information packed into the next hour or so. So we wanna really, go through this information, but please feel free to use the chat. My contact information will be at the end at any time. Feel free to give me a call or an email. Always more than happy to have a conversation with folks about this. So I'd like to start by talking about the, the principles of a total productive maintenance system, okay? To include why is this critical? And it is critical for manufacturers. So why are we here today talking about this? So manufacturing today is becoming more dependent on equipment and processes are increasingly more complex. So for some of you, you're investing in new technologies such as 3D printing, um, cobots. I see a lot of companies that we're going into now exploring these new technologies and how they can integrate them into their existing processes. So that's going to add some more complexity. That's also going to lead to higher skills being required for both operators and maintenance personnel. <clears throat> and let's face it, maintenance work is very difficult to automate. <clears throat> so yes, you can get an automated oiler system, Castrol and many others make it 
Uh, but a lot of maintenance work is difficult to automate. And a lot of it is just familiarity with the equipment. So the bottom line here, how your equipment performs is still very dependent on people. Now you may have seen some definitions of what total productive maintenance is. It's one of the pillars of lean. If you ever see the graphic of the house of lean, you'll see total productive maintenance in there. And there's a whole number of different definitions. So here's Chris's definition of total productive maintenance. And that is the application of lean rules and principles to equipment management. So if your company practices lean manufacturing, this definition will make sense to you. If you go to the floor and see with your own eyes, help your people work as a team to eliminate waste, solve complex problems, learn and continuously improve how your equipment performs, then you'll start to see the benefits. So you always wanna be evaluating the systems and processes that you've built around your equipment and make them better. So here is the lean and total productive maintenance approach. If we start at the top, okay, we've got equipment failures, which happen. We've got minor defects. Minor defects will continually and randomly interact in many new ways and create different kinds of failure. So for maintenance and engineering folks, you know that when you're trying to troubleshoot and you're trying to do root cause analysis, it can be tough to know if the bearing blew because of over temperature, if it blew um, you know, because the filter failed and we got metal shavings, it's very hard to get to that chicken and egg approach. So TPM activities include the relentless pursuit of detecting and correcting all minor machine defects. And I say minor machine defects because everybody notices the big failures, okay? Everybody in the company notices those but not everybody notices all of those little minor things that happen day in and day out. And that's where we really want to hone our focus on. And when we get to the bottom here, when we get to the lean portion of it, we want to eliminate and solve the small and simple problems first. And we want to do that through fast and rapid experimentation. So maybe some of you have heard about Kaizen events or maybe some of you who have worked with us in the past are familiar with the Toyota Kata method. And what that is, is just using fast and rapid experiments, hypothesizing what could happen, what do we wanna to do to address it, let's try it, and then realizing what did or did not happen, and then we adjust and go back and do it again. It's very much the plan, do, check, act cycle. So here's a great quote, eliminating minor equipment abnormalities seems contrary to common sense. Unfortunately, this assumes minor defects play little role in machine failures. It's a false belief. Minor defects taken together are often the primary cause of machine failures. So for a lot of companies, those little minor things, uh, a chain jumped a tooth, you know, the equipment was knocked out of time, whatever, we address it, we, go, we move forward, and we go on to the next fire. But really it's those little minor things that will add up over time and create those major equipment failures that can put us down for an hour, for a shift, or even longer. <clears throat> now the most important thing, there's a team approach to total productive maintenance. So a single ownership system, it pits departments against one another. And, to pursue their own local goals and not that of the organization. We're all very well aware of the production versus maintenance, the maintenance versus production, the production versus quality, the quality versus maintenance. We're all very well aware of those uh, situations, but with a total productive maintenance program, we want to have a maintenance strategy that involves the entire organization, realizing that the maintenance department can't do it by itself. It takes the work and cooperation of everybody to be able to do this. So don't silo problems to one organization. Now here's something I'd like you to think about. I'm gonna give you a moment to think about this. And this is a, a quote that comes from James LaFleur, who's the author of Practical TPM. If more than 40% of the work that your maintenance department is doing is repair, you're in the repair business and not the maintenance business. 
So if you track time, if you track work orders, you take a look at those and notice if more than 40% of those work orders or at that time is repair for something that's down, something that's broken, you're in the repair business. And what happens is you, you may fall into the dog chasing its tail routine of we're doing so much time repairing, we're not spending as much time on PMs. And as PMs fall through the wayside, we're having more breakdowns and then we're spending more time on repair. It's a vicious cycle, right? So just something to think about within your own organization, how much time, you know, off the top of your head, would you think we're spending repairing versus maintaining the equipment? So if we look at some of the, some of the ideas of total productive maintenance, and this comes from Saichi Nakajima, who also authored some texts around the topic, it's carried out on a company-wide basis, okay? Participation from senior management all the way down to operators and floor employees, everybody. It's company-wide. And when we talk about autonomous maintenance, autonomous does not mean floor workers only. It's everybody. So a couple of really, really important points here. Now, what's the ideal state? What is, what's the goal of a total productive maintenance system? The goal of a total productive maintenance system is zero breakdowns and zero product defects, which is a really, really high bar. And all of us are probably saying right now, well, you know, it's, it's, that's not entirely achievable. It's not entirely possible. You're always going to have something that goes wrong. But when I do a lot of work with companies who are ISO certified, a lot of them have on-time delivery as a goal. And their goal is usually somewhere around, you know, it could be 92%, 94%. And I'll always ask the question, why not 100%? And they'll usually tell me, well, we look and we average out around such and such, and we feel it's attainable and things happen and we want to account for that. And that's one approach, but I always like to make the argument, if you set a bar, wherever you set that bar is gonna be where people land. It's gonna be where people strive for. So if our goal is zero breakdowns and zero product defects, then our teams together will work towards continual improvement and we'll discover more and more new things that we can correct along the way. Are we ever gonna get there? Maybe not, but we're gonna learn a whole heck of a lot about our facility and our equipment. And we're gonna make a whole lot of positive changes that I can guarantee you. And we're also gonna talk about how some lean principles fall into this as well, such as 5S. Many of you probably are familiar with the 5S methodology and we'll touch a little bit upon that. So again, talking about TPM principles, preventive maintenance, very important, total quality control, and total employee involvement. This is the Venn diagram of a TPM program. <clears throat> and that total employee involvement is critical. Okay, so now we wanna talk about what are the five elements of a TPM program? And again, feel free to take down some notes. We will make this available afterwards, but I'm gonna go through these and we can take some questions at the end. Number one is we wanna maximize our overall equipment effectiveness, also known as OEE, which is uh, a, largely a lean measure. And I'm curious to know if your company currently tracks overall equipment effectiveness, go ahead and let us know in the chat. Uh, it, not everybody does. It's not entirely difficult to do. It's something that I'm more than happy to have a conversation with folks uh, on how to set that up. And we'll look at that in some subsequent slides but you wanna maximize that number. So when we get there, just keep this in mind. You wanna have a system of preventative maintenance for the life of the equipment. So where do we think the best place to start is when we're putting together a, a preventive maintenance program for a piece of equipment? Let's say we buy a new piece of capital equipment and we wanna to put together a system of preventive maintenance for it. What might be a good place to start? You can go ahead and throw that in the chat. And just let us know your thoughts. Another important element, all departments have to participate. 
You're going to hear this over and over. I'm going to sound like a broken record, but it's very important. So engineering, operations, maintenance, quality, whatever you know, uh, department you have in your organization, they have to work together on this. Every employee is involved. Okay, Senior management all the way down down. And employee motivation. So continuous improvement through small teams that we talked about. And it's very important. It's a leader's job to help guide employees to meet the company's strategic objectives, right? Well, TPM hopefully becomes a strategic objective of your organization. And a lot of times you have operators who may struggle with a piece of equipment and they're unsure of, you know, um, they know that there has to be a better way. And there's a lot of good untapped knowledge in those operators as well. So when we talk about employee motivation, when we talk about the teamwork, that's where we get the idea, the sharing of ideas between departments and coming together and really making some, some really good improvements. So five elements of TPM, we'll review these at the end. Now, I'd like to talk really important, four development stages of equipment maintenance. So these are basically the four types of approaches to a maintenance program. Stage one, breakdown maintenance. This is run to failure. There are companies that have this as a maintenance strategy. Okay, we're gonna run that equipment until that motor burns out. We're gonna order a new Delta or a new Baldor. We'll install it, start the lineup, okay? For some companies, it just makes financial sense for them especially smaller companies. Uh, for larger companies out there, this might seem a little bit primitive, but for a lot of smaller companies, it's how they run. As we look at these, I'd also like you to think about where your organization falls within this chart, okay? So once we move past breakdown maintenance, we get into preventative maintenance. And I'm gonna venture a guess that a good many of you are at this point. Uh, and this is either time-based or usage-based. So a certain number of hours that a piece of equipment runs. Okay, we're gonna replace belts, we're gonna do oiling, we're gonna grease bearings, et cetera, or usage-based. So that machine, if it's an injection molder, it's had how many shots, it's uh, something that's had how many strokes, what have you, it's usage-based. So a lot of times it's time or usage-based. And that's a preventive maintenance program. Then we move into productive maintenance. And you may have heard this as predictive maintenance. And that's where we're learning how that piece of equipment works. And we're getting to know it. We're getting to know it personally. And we know when something's heading towards failure. And there's a lot of different tools to do this, okay? A lot of folks use uh, infrared scanning for temperature so we can monitor when a bearing's about to go. Uh, there's all different technologies. You can use vibration analysis etc. Maybe some of you are doing that today. That's predictive maintenance. So rather than relying upon time or usage, we're, we're relying on how is that piece of equipment actually running at this moment? And should we be planning during our next downtime to replace something? And then the last stage, total productive maintenance, is ideally predictive maintenance but with team, full team involvement like we've been talking about. So again, take a look, think about where your organization currently falls. Uh, and this is, again, the four stages basically of a maintenance program. <clears throat> okay, so- Are we able to ask questions? I'm sorry, I, I yeah, wasn't sure just purely through the chat or not. Um, I think I've been struggling like for the four developmental stages and like trying to figure out my own preventative maintenance type of program. Because it's, it's just me most of the time um, for two really large <laughs> industrial shops. How do you find a balance of like what is worth my time? Um, you know, and like which system? How do you determine all of these things? I feel like I'm either like way overdoing things or I'm, I'm under. Like I can't find that like middle sweet spot. Absolutely. This so basic. <laughs> no, that's, that's a great question. So I threw out there earlier something to think about. What's a good place to start with a maintenance plan when you get some new equipment in? And a good place to start is simply the manufacturer's recommended plan. So very similar to when you buy a car, somewhere in the manual, it's going to have a 
uh, a maintenance schedule. And it tells you at 20,000 miles, do this, at 40,000, do that. Um, capital equipment, the maintenance, uh, the manufacturers can have something very similar. So that's a good place to start. Another good thing to do is track your run hours against all of those little things that go wrong so that you have a history. And that history is going to tell you where to focus and where not to focus. So you'll learn a lot about your equipment. A lot of times what happens, those minor failures, like I said, we, we fix them, we address them and we move on. But after six months, we, we really don't realize that, well, wow, that's happened a dozen times. I probably should look at, at you know, something a little bit more progressive to put that issue to bed or at least mitigate it from happening all the time like it has been. So very simple, could be an Excel spreadsheet, right? Could be a piece, could be a notepad, but just keep an, a note of how much is that equipment running versus what are the things that I'm having to do to it? How, where is it failing and how? Collect that data over a series of time and then take a look and let the data tell you, or let that guide you where to start. So hopefully that, that's a good starting point. Now, that bring, that's a really nice segue into the six big losses for equipment. So when we talk about, you know, what, where should we be focusing our time? These are the three areas that overall equipment effectiveness calculate. And we're going to talk about the calculation, but I just want to explain the three areas right now. You have availability, you're going to measure performance efficiency, and quality. When we talk about availability, we're talking about how much time is that equipment actually available for production. So if I run an eight hour shift and I've got some setups in there that I've got to be doing, you know, I have three setups that total 15 minutes each, eight hours minus 45 minutes, that's going to be my availability. So we have setup and adjustment times in there that we account for, and obviously equipment failure. So if my equipment goes down for an hour, I'm no longer at seven hours and 15 minutes availability. I'm at six hours and 15 minutes of availability. When we talk about performance efficiency, what we're talking about is any idling or minor stoppages and reduced speed. So sometimes companies will deal with a product that is priced out at a certain run rate. And we go to the floor and we realize that we're not running at that run rate. We're running at a reduced run rate. And when we talk to the operator to ask, we find out, well, at this run rate, we get all these issues. We have product backing up. We get poor quality. We get this, we get that. So we dropped it down a few ticks and it seems to be running okay. Very common, right? To the operator, they did a wonderful thing because now you're getting good product out, but it's going to affect your balance sheet. So you want to get in front of that and address it. And then idling and minor stoppages this is where we have equipment running, but no product coming out. Or this is where we're constantly stopping and starting every 30 seconds because we're addressing something or we have to clear something or there's something going on. And then obviously when we talk about quality, we're talking about scrap and re rework and we're talking about yield loss. So we were supposed to get 100 units out of that run. We got 97 or we got less than that. That's what we're talking about quality. So those are the three major areas that overall equipment effectiveness monitors and the six big areas within those that we see loss. So let's look at it a little bit differently, okay? When we measure overall equipment effectiveness, it is a calculation of our availability number times our performance efficiency number times our quality number. And next, I'm gonna show you what that calculation looks like. So again, some of you may be doing this today, but when we look at availability, and there's a number of different ways that you can look at this if you, if you search it online, but it's really what's our, our loading time minus our downtime dividing up by our loading time. So time available to run minus any planned downtime, such as setups or maintenance, divided by that, original runtime. Performance efficiency is our theoretical cycle time times our process units divided by our operating time. 
So did we actually get the amount of units we were supposed to in the time that we were supposed to, which means if we had a run rate of 50 strokes per minute, where did we fall in that? If we had some stoppages in there, we're gonna average out to less than 100. And finally, the quality number is simply how much did we make? How much did we lose divided by the processed amount, what we made? And these are all percentages. That's why you see the times 100. So again, more than happy to go through this with anyone um, you know, afterwards. Feel free to let me know. But basic OEE calculation right here. We want to look at what's our percent availability, our performance efficiency, and what's the quality or what's the yield that we're actually getting off the line. So when we talk about ideal OE, world-class overall equipment effectiveness is generally defined around 85%. And you can see the calculations on the screen. Generally considered about 85% world-class. I'm gonna tell you, and if, you know anybody who does this already, if you start doing this for your company, do not be surprised if you're less than 33%. And I don't say that because your organization um, doesn't know what they're doing or has a lot of issues or whatnot. I'm simply saying that. Don't be surprised if you fall in the 30 to 50% range when you start to do this. It's not at all uncommon. It does not mean that your facility does a horrible job of either producing product or maintaining equipment. So please don't think that. But it is something that is pretty good to start tracking as a means of improving. <clears throat> so again, more than happy to go through that uh, in detail with anybody afterwards. I just want to keep going through a lot of the good information that we have here. So overall equipment effectiveness, what's our availability, what's our efficiency of our equipment, and how much yield are we getting out of what we're supposed to be getting. When we talk about zero defects, this comes from Philip Crosby. This is from Quality is Free, which is an excellent publication. Quality is conformance to requirements. Sometimes I'll see companies define quality as the absolute best that something can be, and we over-engineer it. But quality is simply conformance to whatever the customer wants. <clears throat> and a system of quality is prevention. So a quality system is to help us prevent, uh, you know, bad product, defects, et cetera, getting out of our four walls and hopefully coming off of our machines. Performance standards should be zero defects. We talked about that. It's one of the pillars of TPM program. And the measurement of quality is the price of non-conformance. So for anybody who's familiar with the cost of quality, you have appraisal costs and prevention costs, and it's the hiring of a quality inspector. It's the investment in calibrated equipment. And a lot of companies look at that and say, well, we're not at that point yet, or it's a cost we're unwilling to take at this moment. So that cost is the price of nonconformance. In other words, if we're putting out product that doesn't meet requirements because we don't have measuring equipment to test or not, what have you, it's the price of nonconformance. So that's what we mean when we talk about zero defects. What are some countermeasures that we have for zero breakdowns? Well, maintain well-regulated conditions. And this comes back to 5S, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But we want to have clean work area, clean equipment, maintain lubrication schedules, everything is adjusted, tight bolts, chains, you name it. You want to really have well-regulated conditions. You want to adhere to proper standard operating procedures. Your organization may have these, or at the very least, you'll wanna follow the manufacturer's recommendation uh, when you talk about equipment maintenance, okay? But it's also very important to train operators the right and the wrong way to operate equipment, right? Because we all know, and I was there once, I was guilty of it, um, you know, machine is, is out of tolerance or what have you, and it's a hip check, or it's, you know, smash this here and it's back on track but that only leads to more problems down the line. So you really wanna have some good training with those folks using it. And restore deterioration. So standard, having standard repair methods, uh, a clean work environment and a clean piece of equipment allows you to find and, pre 
and predict the deterioration. So we really want to stay on top of that. I've been in shops that have equipment that they're running that was produced in the 60s. Not uncommon at all for textile. A lot of shops have looms that are from the 60s and 70s, and they're still running today, and they're still running very well, and it's because they're well-maintained. Okay, <clears throat> some more countermeasures. Improved design weaknesses. Here we're getting a little bit more advanced. And what we mean by this is our internal team may identify some areas that the manufacturer themselves didn't. And we may put some plans in place or some preventive measures that we notice make a difference. So when I say start with the manufacturer's recommended schedule, it's a good place to start, but your team may identify some better ways or some better timing or some better schedule uh, that can improve upon some design weaknesses. So if I were to ask everybody, have you ever bought a piece of equipment and later found that there were some quirks or there were some things that didn't do as well, uh, you'll probably tell me, yeah, we've dealt with that. Well, think about what you've done to overcome it. And last thing, improve operation and maintenance skills. Again, this comes down to training. So when we look at the TPM list on the right, uh, it's just a simple diagram. And there's a few that we didn't discuss. 5S, it's the foundation of TPM. So if you can't develop the discipline of 5S, it's gonna be really difficult to develop the discipline for TPM. In early equipment management, so active involvement in defining and purchasing the next generation of equipment based on your learning, based on what you've learned as an organization thus far. So those are some of the TPM principles. What I'd like to do is just check in on the chat before we move on to our next section. Great. Thanks, Chris. And thanks, Mackenzie, for asking that question, because it, it really is something everybody could relate to. Right. Um, so one question that came in was, how do you tr best track OEE? You talked a few times about OEE. How do you best track that? I, I got to say, I did a quick count and we were running about two to one people who aren't tracking OEE. So how do you best track OEE? So. The best way I'll tell you to track OEE is using a simple spreadsheet. It could be Excel or Google Sheets or whatever you happen to use. Uh, and you know we can help you put that together and, and get that up and running. But the best way is just to use a simple spreadsheet. If you use a CMMS, a computerized maintenance management system, you have, which is essentially software for your maintenance program, you may have OEE tracking in there. You can certainly buy standalone software to do this, but I'll tell you that a spreadsheet does everything that those software packages do and at no cost, honestly, if you use something like Google Sheets. So I would certainly recommend starting with a spreadsheet. Great question. Excellent, thank you. One other question, and I think it related to, at one point you had a stat about 40% of your time is spent in repair. Mm -hmm. And the question was, it is what would be the world-class number, you know, so that somebody could gauge how much time they're spending on repair versus how much time they should be spending mm -hmm. on repair? No, that's a great question. Uh, so if you look it up, you'll see a lot of differing numbers. I've seen things in the five to 8% range, which is very aggressive, Wow, very aggressive. But um, some people go as high as 10%, but I'll, I'll read a lot in the five to 8% range. And that's, again, something broke. Some piece of equipment is down. We have to repair it. That's what that refers to. Excellent. Thanks. I think that's the questions that we have for now. Okay, great. So again, please feel free to put those in the chat. But now I'd like to talk about how do we implement a TPM program? So on the screen, you see the three stages of TPM development. And usually when we're in person, I'll look around and I'll see people's faces and I'll see a, you know, a look that says, my goodness, you know, you're talking two to three years here. Uh, some folks will say, I, I want to put this together and, I, you know, I can do it in like six to eight weeks. It's very much, well, it is. It's the same process as putting in a lean culture and building a lean culture. It doesn't happen overnight. So generally you're looking three to six months, just preparation, just getting senior management on board, um, just starting to build the schedules, et cetera, getting the equipment up to spec, et cetera. Implementation 
could be two to three years. Okay. For some of you, it's going to be faster. For some of you, you're smaller shops, you have less equipment. Um, for those of you larger shops, more equipment, it's going to take it's going to take some time. And then that stage three stabilization, that's where our techs and our operators are learning more about the equipment and further refining our plans. So what I'm gonna do is go through the 12 steps for TPM, some of the things just to be aware of when you wanna go through this. Step one, top management announces the decision to implement TPM. It has to come from top management, very much like a lean culture. So as an organization, you make the decision, this is the direction we wanna go. And by the way, you have our full support, our being top management. Step two, education and campaign for TPM. Let the entire organization know what are we doing and why are we doing it? Okay, what are the benefits? What's in it for me? What's in it for that operator who's using that piece of equipment day in and day out? <clears throat> you wanna create structures to promote TPM. So it's gonna be a mix of education, a mix of training, um, on the job work, et cetera. It's gonna be promoting all of the benefits that we can see, capturing data from what we deal with now so that we can quantify it. You wanna establish basic TPM policies and goals, which are things like key process indicators or key performance indicators, any kind of metrics that your organization is currently following. You wanna have a master plan for TPM development. <clears throat> So it could be a multi-year vision. Where do we want to be? Where do we sit now? What are we looking to do? What do we hope to accomplish? These are very easy questions to answer. So it's going to take some time to put this plan together. You're going to want to hold a TPM kickoff. That's where we draw the line in the sand and we say, you know, up until now, we've been either a run to breakdown or a you know, time or usage-based maintenance program. And we want to move forward. We want to get everybody involved. You want to improve the effectiveness of each piece of equipment. So every piece of equipment is unique. Every piece will have a different maintenance schedule and plan, different training, different procedures, et cetera. So now you can start to see why it takes so long to do that, to put these into place. You want to develop an autonomous maintenance program. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, a scheduled maintenance program. So we're actually putting in, you can see a, just an example. And you again, you can search these on the web. What does it look like? If you've got a computerized maintenance system, it's gonna spit these out at you. Uh, but you can certainly download templates and fill them out, however you create that schedule. And again, start with the, the manufacturer's recommended schedule and then add to it as your organization learns what works for you. Conduct training to improve operations and maintenance skills and make sure that training incorporates the sharing of ideas. So as you get other folks involved and you learn some of the tips and tricks that they have, leverage those, celebrate those. Those are really some continual improvement wins that can help to drive improvement. So you wanna make sure that everybody's operating in the same way. Develop an early equipment management program so that is when we start talking about predictive maintenance. That's where we're learning what the machine is, is. Our machines are talking to us all day long. Are we listening? So that's where we're really starting to utilize some advanced technology, vibration analysis, IR scanning, et cetera, uh, to be able to tell when our equipment is starting to go astray and when we need to take action. And then of course, the last step, perfect TPM implementation and raise expectations. So we've got our goal, can we do better? <clears throat> customer, so you see on the screen, customer satisfaction, on-time delivery, quality goals. Um, these are things that can be directly impacted by the performance of our equipment. So as we continue to improve our equipment, we can continue to improve our goals organization-wide. Okay. And when we talk about autonomous maintenance, we're talking about the, uh, the teamwork between production maintenance, quality maintenance, everything that we talked about earlier. Okay, before we get to the next step, just wanna do a quick check-in. Did anything stand out to folks? The timeline, it's so long. 
Is that really true, Chris? Does it really take that long? I think it's uh, dependent on, on the organization. I mean, we have a lot of complex machinery here and working toward a TPM organization. I think it's more, you know, you focus on what's in front of you because it does, it takes a very long time. I've been at it for about a year now and mm -hmm. I am nowhere close. It's going to be a three to five year project by the time we get to the point where I could say, hey, here we are. I mean, after a year, year and a half, just starting to implement um, predictive maintenance practices. So it's it's... It takes time to and gathering data is the most important thing. I would I would urge anyone not to rush it so it's done properly. So that's just two cents from, from the peanut gallery. That, that, and that's wonderful, Michael. Thank you. So you hit a lot of great points, right? Um, very similar to a lean implementation. When we go into an organization and they want to implement some lean practices, we always start with pilot area. Some people call it a pilot plant. Um, don't bite off more than you can chew. So you may end up using a particular line or a particular piece of equipment, and that's where you're going to hone a lot of what you're going to do, data collection, et cetera. And then take what you learned from that and roll it out to the rest of your plant, um, you know, one line or one piece of equipment at a time. Because if you start with the whole plant in mind, it can become overwhelming really fast. And that's where people tend to drop it. The other thing you mentioned, uh, the integrity of data, garbage in, garbage out. Right, so if you're not capturing the right data or you don't have good data um, coming in, it's really gonna throw things off. It's really gonna make this hard for you. So excellent points, thank you so much. We did have one other question, Chris. Sure. And it was about how do you get the operators to engage with maintenance? Oh, that's a great, that's a great question. So I made a joke earlier about the production versus maintenance battle that's been going on since the industrial revolution <laughs> and everybody even though you're on mute you're laughing right now because you all know what i'm talking about so <clears throat> what we found what i found in a past life is uh we had work cells and by and large you know the same operators were in the same cells and by and large our maintenance our engineering department would do pms on the same equipment so it was kind of like a built-in ownership on both sides. And what we said one day was, listen, you know, so-and-so operator, so-and-so um, tech, you're gonna be a team and you're gonna communicate with each other because that operator knows when that machine starts ticking and it's making a noise that they've not heard before. They know when it's vibrating in a way that they're not familiar with. And I want you to raise your hand and bring that up to the tech whose piece of equipment that is to do PM work on and really foster that teamwork so if you have something like that in your facility where you've got techs and operators who tend to focus on similar equipment, you know, really let them know that their teamwork uh, is what's going to help drive this program. And what ended up happening, and it took a little while, but what ended up happening was they would come together and have great conversations uh, and really learn from each other about that equipment. So that's a really great question. Excellent. So the phases of a TPM program, okay? This is where we were talking about 5S. So a lot of you may already be familiar with it. Um, if you're not, it's a five-step program. Each step begins with the letter S, hence the name. We wanna start with sorting out everything we don't need from the area. All of those parts that we've held on to for a piece of equipment we jumped in 1984. Let's get rid of them, okay? So we've got, and you know, again, I see it all the time. So let's get that out. Let's really start with a clean slate. Brings us to step two. What's left, we wanna set it in order. We wanna have a place for everything and everything in its place. While we're going through this, we wanna take the time to shine. If your equipment is dirty or caked with grease or such, um, it's very hard to maintain. It's very hard to know when something's going wrong. How many times, okay, and don't answer this, but how many times do you see oil sight glasses for hydraulic fluid, whatever, and they're simply caked with grease. You just can't get a reading from it. You know, what good is that doing the organization? So again, something to think about. Then we wanna standardize. We actually wanna have some standard ways that the piece of equipment is operated, that the piece of equipment is maintained. And of course, the last step, sustain, is probably the most difficult step but once we've gone through those steps and we've got a really great system in place, we have to maintain it. We can always make it better. 
we're not locked in today to exactly what we've written, we can always make it better, but we don't want to slide backwards. So again, when you start this and, you know, Michael, you can probably think about your past uh, year and a half experience. You want to restore equipment to as new condition as you can. You really want to get it back within factory specification, clean up all of those oil site glasses and, and replace filters, everything that you have to do. Identify complete maintenance plans. So for every piece of equipment, you're going to have a unique maintenance plan. Implement maintenance plans with precision. Right? So make certain that every aspect of the plan is performed identi identically uh, by everybody involved in it. Really difficult for you folks who are multi-ship. Okay? And I'm not even going to get into the, the difficulties of, of standardizing multi-ship plants, but it's very important that everybody's doing it the same way. Prevent recurring machine failures. Uh, going back to what I said earlier, capture data. Start to look at what are those little things that we're fighting. And oh, by the way, this is happening pretty frequently. So maybe there's an opportunity to call up the manufacturer or the rep and get some sense of what they can do. Techs are more than happy to come out and visit your facility. Maybe there's an opportunity for there to be um, a third party maintenance provider. What, whatever you need to do, you really wanna to get to the bottom of those minor stoppages that add up over time and cost you money. And improve machine productivity. So if we're costing our machine to run at a certain rate or to put out a certain number of units and we're not, it's costing us money, right? We're taking a hit somewhere. So that's gonna be our goal. Okay, a lot of good information, a lot of great questions. Why don't we do a final wrap up here and then I'm more than happy to tackle anything that you'd like to talk about in the chat. So just to review briefly, five elements, of total productive maintenance. Maximize overall equipment effectiveness. What does that number look like? It's not going to be 100%. Again, world class is 85%. Most companies, realistically, 33 to 50%. I'd say if you start going north of 55, 60%, you're doing really well. So don't let that number fool you, but you always want to try to maximize it. Have a system of preventative maintenance for the life of that equipment. We're always gonna follow that maintenance plan unless we improve upon it, but we're not gonna slide backwards on it. All departments have to participate. It has to be uh, a joint effort between engineering, maintenance, production, quality, whoever you have on your team. Everybody's gotta be aware. Every employee is involved from senior management down. Senior management has to make the commitment to the program and has to support it, just like a lean implementation. And again, employee motivation. So continually improving through small teams. Operators, they'll tell you, there's little things every day that they struggle with, but they get by. Boy, how great is it if they can put a small Kaizen team together and put whatever that little thing is to bed once and for all. It really goes a long way towards morale and towards boosting that motivation. So the five elements. TPM has all of its roots in lean. You'll usually see it listed in the House of Lean graphic, even though there's a number of different iterations of that. Management must lead the program and stay actively involved. It's critical. It takes a village. It's always gonna be about that team approach. I don't have to tell you, capital equipment is expensive and complex. And like we talked about early on, it's very difficult to automate maintenance tasks. And productive maintenance is more than preventative maintenance. So think preventive maintenance, time-based, usage-based, maybe a mix of the two. However, we wanna to get to that next step. And this is a little favorite of Polaris MEP. <laughs> Cycle time is king, variability is the enemy. So again, if something's costed to run at 50 strokes, however many shots, however many of this, um, what, whenever you're not hitting that, it's costing money. <clears throat> so cycle time is king, variability is the enemy. Before we break for the last questions, and I left just a good amount of time to be able to take those, we want to know, and you know, for those of who have joined us before, you're familiar with this, 
uh, we're going to be sending out a brief survey. And you get a lot of surveys in the course of your day. And I promise this is brief, but it's very important to us. It helps us to take these webinars and these um, you know, information sessions and really make them better for you. So I would really appreciate it. And Polaris would, MEP would really appreciate it. If you would just take a few minutes afterwards, fill this out, let us know what you thought of today. Did it meet your expectations? If you fill that out, um, we're more than happy to send a copy of these slides to you. So if you'd like a copy of the slides, please take a few minutes of your day, just fill out the survey, and we'll go ahead and get that into your hands. Thanks, Chris. I put a link to the survey into chat, but we'll also send it in a follow-up email. So you'll get it in two ways. Excellent. Very good. Any questions? Anything that's come up? So we did have a question from Rick in the chat, and he asked, is OEE calculated for each machine or for the entire operation? It's a good question, Rick. So I have seen it done by line. So if you have a production line, um, you could do it for that entire line. I've seen folks do it organization-wide. I will tell you that OEE is a very high level indicator. Uh, the folks that use it organization-wide, it's a high level indicator of our overall approach to maintenance. So what OEE won't tell you is, hi, we're low in this area because, you know, the stamper over on line four has been skipping lately um, and is putting out bad product. It won't tell you that. It'll simply tell you that somewhere in our system we have an issue. So it's a high level indicator. You can use it organization-wide. It makes sense to use it organization-wide, but I have seen some companies split it into a production line. What I haven't seen is OEE for every single individual piece of capital equipment. I think that's a little bit too complex to track. It almost sounds like if you set goals for the whole organization and then you make sure that you've got some sort of visual to know how everybody's contributing to the goal. Yeah, yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I'm going to hop in via audio for a second, only because it's hard to phrase via text. Um, sure. One of the biggest challenges that I'm having with, with implementing TPM is getting the front end on board, um, the engineering group, and um, even not so much senior management, but middle management um, as far as, so we're going through a lot of, we're trying to increase our capacity while not increasing headcount, which means that, that we're not getting rid of anybody, we're trying to add more automation. This comes with a lot of planning up front, a lot of capital investment and equipment. And what I'm having trouble doing is, is getting the upfront support of, hey, you need to be involved so we can do uh, you know, reliability assessments. We can make sure we have spare parts lists. Uh, we understand the machine, its challenges. You know, what oils do you need? What lubricants do you need? What, uh, you know, all, all of that stuff. But it should be done well before the machine enters the building. In fact, it should be a sign off before it even enters the building. But um, I'm trying to get my difficulties getting that kind of uh, traction with with engineering program management type of group. Mm -hmm. Any okay. advice on that? I mean, have you ever had to see those uh, challenges before? You want to think of the what's in it for me. It always comes down to what's in it for me. So great point. Not uncommon. Um, my background, where I came from, we had engineering department of about 22 folks. Uh, with a chief engineer, and they had a computerized maintenance system that had roughly, let's call it around about 1,500 PMs a month, okay? So in this system, there were 1,500 PMs a month, and they were spit out every day, and folks would have to do it, and we had a lot of trouble getting those done. I think we had a rate of about 72 or 74% completion, so we were having breakdowns. Uh, when we looked at TPM, we recognized that we could involve the operator. And what maintenance did is they went through that list of 1,500 PMs and they identified that roughly one third of those, so roughly 500, let's say, don't require any specialized maintenance skills. It could be oiling, it could be greasing, it could be visual inspection, whatever. Here's things that we can give the operator to do, okay? Whether it's a little overtime, whether it's time during the shift, um, here are things that we can take off maintenance, but so we could give one, roughly one third of maintenance is time back to them to then focus on PMs and some other improvement projects, et cetera. Great. What happened when we, when we pitched that to the production manager? Okay. It wasn't a pretty conversation. 
So the production manager has their concerns. I don't want my folks touching equipment. I don't want my folks taking this time. I don't want, I don't want, I don't want. And it really took a concerted effort to get the data um, to show them that a lot of time is wasted and a lot of frustration is being borne by the production folks having to deal with these breakdowns and having to deal with you know, um, poor numbers, low quality and such. So it really took a while, but we were able to get folks to see that if we try this program and we're able to improve our efficiency and improve our uptime, it's gonna cause less frustration. We're gonna see better numbers. The employees are gonna feel better. And that's where, you know, that's at the point that I left, that was where they were heading and it was heading in the right direction, but it took a while. So yes, it's going to be that question of, you know, somebody's gonna say, well, I don't want my team taking on such and such responsibility. You've got to make the case of why it's gonna benefit them. Understood, thank you. That's a great point. And a lot of folks deal with that. Yeah, and it's funny because I actually had an easier time with operators. Um, using that very same method. I guess it could, should just apply at all levels, but you know, I get a lot of operator buy-in just individually because they want their machines fixed. They want them running well. It makes their life and job a lot easier, so. Yeah, and, that, and that's the funny thing is the operate, your operators are your best source of knowledge of how that equipment's running today. <clears throat> and it, you know, I know a lot of maintenance folks will argue with me on that, but day in and day out, they work with that piece of equipment, they know what it should sound like. They know what it should feel like. They know if it's hot, if it's this, that. Um, they're your best source of information. And when they struggle with a piece of equipment, their whole day is, is, is gonna be harsh. So definitely a great resource. Great point. Any other questions that we have? Hi, this is McKinsey again, Chris. Just mm -hmm. thank you so much. Um, I'm a total newbie to all of these things. I've just been figuring shit out as I go, basically. <laughs> Um, but I had, this may not totally relate, but hence I'm asking the question. So I, one of my jobs is a fleet manager of a boathouse. Um, and I'm, I'm starting from scratch. They've never had any, any sort of program for maintenance or anything. And I've been trying to start the system and getting some systems into place for, what I am now learning is called TBM. How do you balance though, like developing an inventory, like management type of system? How does it relate then in developing your TBM? Is there like, I don't know. I'm like, I'm doing gestures because that's all I got. I don't have words. Um, that, that's a, so inventory management, you're talking spare parts and you know, what, what should we have on hand and such? Once you start gathering the data of just simply tracking what's breaking down, when it, when it happened, uh, you'll start to look back at history and notice, okay, this is high, high failure. Um, so we're going to want to have some of that. Any kind of, um, we'll call them spare parts. You always want to have, a, you know, you always want to have oils and greases on hand. You always want to have cotter pins and bolts and bearings and such, because those are, those are failure parts, right? What you're talking about is what do I do for motors? You know, motors are very expensive. Um, if anything is run by a PLC, you know, a PLC or a VFD, these are very expensive pieces of equipment. I don't want one on my shelf if I don't need it, tying up necessary, you know, cash. So all of your, we'll call it consumables, um, you'll wanna make sure you have plenty of spare parts for. But one thing that you can do is just call the equipment vendor, or if you happen to know somebody else using that equipment and get their feedback. You know, what do you recommend as a starting point while I'm gathering my data based on how we use that equipment and seeing you know, what works for us? Thank you. You've also given me validation because of all the data collection I've been doing and I've been beating, beating myself up thinking it's taking so much longer than it should, you know, air quotes should. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm actually, I think, in better position than I uh, originally thought. Just thanks Excellent. for sharing knowledge. Excellent. And I'm more than happy to have a conversation afterwards. Uh, for folks who know me, I'm always, if I'm in your area, always more than happy to drop by, take a look. We can talk about it. So, you know, hopefully we can connect afterwards. But Anybody else while we have a, a minute left have a question?
for fear of being too marketing me on our website, we have a number of case studies, including one that I placed a link to earlier in the chat. And that might also help you with validating and with talking to kind of middle management, showing them how another company benefited um, from getting that buy-in from everybody up, up, up and down the line. Uh, sometimes it can be helpful. That's that outside perspective, that outside data. Absolutely, great point. Contact information is on your screen. I'd like to thank everybody one more time for joining us this morning. I realize you all have important things to do, so we're always appreciative when you spend your time with us. Hopefully it was helpful. More than happy to talk to anybody after this. Again, be on the lookout for the survey. We really appreciate if you would complete it and we'll send you a copy of our slides. Thank you so much for this morning. Thanks, Chris.